Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history. I love history. If you love history too, this is the channel for you. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor December 7th of 1941, that was just the start of a larger campaign. Within seven hours, Japanese forces were besieging the British in Malaya, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and attacking American forces in the Philippine Islands, on Guam, and on the tiny atoll of Wake Island. Now, some of these were longer campaigns, but some were short battles, and those battles were overshadowed by the attack on Pearl Harbor. And yet they represent the first efforts of American ground forces in the Second World War, and these small forces, largely cut off from aid from the United States, deserve to be remembered. And so today we are going to remember the fierce, nearly forgotten, 1941 defense of Wake Island by an outnumbered, outgunned force of Marines, sailors, soldiers, and civilians. Wake Island is a tiny, triangle-shaped coral atoll encompassing less than three square miles of land. The United States claimed the uninhabited island in 1899, thinking that it could be a good coaling station for Navy ships between Hawaii and the Philippine Islands. In 1936, Pan American Airways gained a lease in order to build a way station on their Trans-Pacific Flying Clippers route. The Pan American Airways Hotel was the first permanent settlement in the history of Wake Island. Then, in 1941, fearing a Japanese buildup in the Pacific, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt ordered that Wake Island be built into a military installation, including the construction of an airfield. By December of 1941, the island held 450 officers and men of the 1st Marine Defense Battalion, a Marine squadron of 12 F-4F Wildcat fighter aircraft, 68 U.S. Navy personnel, 5 U.S. Army personnel, and over 1,200 civilians mostly civil engineers working on the construction of the base and a few Pan American Airlines personnel. On the morning of December 8th, Pan American Airlines had just sent their Philippine Clipper into the air, destined for Guam. The base was just waking up when, at 7 a.m., news first arrived of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Knowing that Wake Island would soon be attacked, the base commander, Navy Commander Winfield Scott Cunningham, ordered the Marines on the island to battle stations asked Pan American Airlines to recall the Philippine Clipper and sent four of the F-4F Wildcats into the air to look for enemy aircraft. Unfortunately, because of heavy cloud cover, the four Wildcats missed the first Japanese attack of 34 land-based bombers. The Japanese devastated the airfield, destroyed the eight Wildcats that were still on the ground and killed much of the ground crew, and did a lot of damage to the Pan American facility. The Marines fired back as best they could with their 12 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, but because of the altitude of the Japanese planes, they were difficult to target. They didn't shoot any down, but they did manage to damage eight of the planes. Amazingly, the Pan Am Clipper was undamaged and was able to make it out with its passengers and many of the Pan American employees. The airfield was devastated and had only four operable aircraft and many of the ground crew were dead. Fortunately, many of the civilian engineers were volunteering to help with the defense and there happened to be a couple of mechanics among them who proved to be invaluable at keeping the airplanes in the air. The Japanese air attacks continued on the 9th and 10th, doing more damage to facilities, causing some casualties, and again the Marines fired back, not shooting down any aircraft but damaging several of the Japanese planes. The Japanese commander, Rear Admiral Sadamichi Kajioka, assumed that the Wake Island defenders had been devastated by all the bombing attacks, and so he planned his land invasion to occur on December 11th. The force that he brought was substantial. He had three light cruisers, six destroyers, two patrol boats, and two transports. To defend against this attack, the Marines had six 5.5-inch naval guns that had been rescued from a refit of the battleship Texas, and of course, the four operable F-4F Wildcats. The Marines held their fire until the Japanese ships were in close, and when they opened up, it was a devastating barrage. The Japanese ships raked by the 5.5-inch guns that they didn't even know that the Marines had. Two shells struck into the magazine of the Japanese destroyer Hiate, and it exploded with a loss of all hands. As the ships were trying to retreat under fire, a bomb from one of the Wildcats landed amongst a bunch of depth charges on the destroyer Kisaragi, and it too exploded with a loss of all hands. Stunned by the ferocious attack, Kajioka was forced to withdraw. This was the first Japanese naval defeat of the Second World War, and it was the only amphibious landing of the Second World War to be repelled by shore guns. Kajioki, who was 
humbled by the sizable casualties, was forced to retreat and ask for support from the fleet that had attacked Pearl Harbor. Japanese air attacks continued, and slowly the four Wildcat fighters were put out of commission, damaged beyond repair. But before the little air force was grounded, they had shot down at least 21 Japanese aircraft. The defenders of Wake were hoping for a relief force from the United States, but after Pearl Harbor, the Navy was stretched thin in the Pacific. A relief force was put together, but it was still hundreds of miles away when Kajioka returned for his second attack with a significantly reinforced fleet. That included two of the carriers that had been at Pearl Harbor, the Hiryu and the Soryu, and four heavy cruisers. The final Japanese attack came on December 23rd, supported by massive air attacks from the aircraft of the two aircraft carriers. And still, the outnumbered defenders managed to destroy two of the patrol craft. Those were converted destroyers that were used to land the Japanese troops. The fight was brief and bitter. The Marines held out through the night and into the next day. But as the fight went on, it was clear that there was nothing else to gain. And finally, Commander Cunningham ordered his troops to lay down arms and surrender. By the time the fight was over, the Wake Island defenders had taken 171 casualties, killed and wounded. Seventy of the dead were civilians. But on the other side, the Japanese had taken more than 1,100 casualties, including the crews of the two destroyers. In addition, they had lost two destroyers, two patrol boats, a transport, more than 20 aircraft, and dozens of other aircraft and eight other ships were severely damaged in the fight. 368 United States Marines, 60 United States Navy personnel, 5 United States Army personnel, and 1,104 American civilians went into Japanese captivity that day. All but 100 were sent to the Japanese mainland where they endured the horrors of Japanese prisoner of war camps during the war, but 100 of the civilians were kept on Wake Island as slave labor. And then in 1943, fearing that an American invasion of the island was imminent, the Japanese commander at the time, Admiral Shimatsu Sakiabara, had the 98 survivors from that group executed. It was a war crime for which Sakiabara was eventually tried, convicted, and hanged. The invasion never came. The island was only handed back to the United States after the end of the war, officially surrendered September 4th, 1945. The Air Force is in charge of the island now. They still operate the airstrip as a refu refueling site, and there's a small missile defense site. There are 94 permanent residents of Wake Island. The Wake Island defenders didn't necessarily change the war, but they did represent to an American public, shocked after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, that Americans really could fight. And to the Japanese, who found great success early in the war, that well, it might not be as easy as they thought it would be. Certainly, though, the Wake Island defenders proved that they deserved to be remembered because, because they did their duty as well as anyone could ask of them. I'm the History Guy. Hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. If you did enjoy it, then please click that thumb up button there on your left if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write them in the comment section and I will be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of Forgotten History, all you need to do is click that subscribe button there on your right.